Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Rosalie Martin event series. My name's Claire Davis, and I'm your MC for tonight. And it's great to be back after missing a few uh, meetings uh, through the course of the last year. So tonight, we're really looking forward to hearing from Dr. John Yaxley and from Dr. Nick Brown and about their leading prostate cancer research. Now, before we launch into our speakers, I'd like to introduce Claudia Zsuzsermann. So she is our newly appointed general manager at the Wesley Medical Research, and Claudia is the senior executive with over 16 years experience in medical research. She's performed roles based around collaborative development, strategic implementation, and change facilitation across a number of high profile organizations. Claudia joined Wesley Medical Research on July 22nd, so she's very, very new to the role. And I'd now like to invite Claudia to share a few words. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Some of you I've met earlier, and some of you I'll meet tonight, and um, you know, during the course of my time here. And it's just such a pleasure to be involved in in this group so thank you so much for coming it's been about almost a month since i started and um, we've got some wonderful uh, researchers that will be presenting presenting this evening and i don't want to steal their thunder but i did want to share with you one of my experiences um, since i've started um, it was tuesday last week about six o'clock in the morning, I get an email from our senior research manager saying, Claudia, would you like to meet one of our patients? And of course I thought, what a great opportunity. Um, and so I met 71-year-old Wayne. Um, it was an interesting experience. He was uh, sitting in a treatment chair with an infusion in his arm and he said to me, um, I was given six months to live. Uh, he has a rare genetic disorder that eats away at his muscles and um, people like him die of respiratory failure. And I sat there next to him and he looked me in the eye and he said, Wesley Medical Research saved my life. And he said, it didn't just save my life in terms of clinical outcomes, um, it healed me psychologically. And I think that's what really hit me because what he was trying to tell me is um, Wesley Medical Research didn't just give me medical care, Wesley Medical Research gave me a family. He said every single one of the trial coordinators are a personal friend of mine. I don't know about you, but I've been in the health sector for a while and it, I think it's rare that a patient actually says, um, I'm here for the family. And, and, it's, and that's like the feel that I get from Wesley Medical Research and even some of you that I've met tonight, it's just a, I don't know, I think it's a unique uh, feature of who Wesley Medical Research is. Um, then the other thing that kind of really hit me was uh, he said uh, the amount of resources that Wesley Medical Research has put into me, a single patient in the, uh, in the whole of Australia and New Zealand on this trial, uh, is phenomenal. And he said, I'm not worth it. Um, and that was very real for me. Uh, he assured me he wasn't crying as a tear welled up in his eye. Um, it was just that his eyes get watery, he said. Um, so what do you say to that? You could say nothing, or you could say, well, um, it's lovely that, you know, Wesley Medical Research was able to do that for you. Or you could say, and, and this is true, well, we've been looking at, at, at our, the financial viability of our clinical trial unit and, you know, outcomes are pending on which trials we'll be shutting down and which ones stay open, but I didn't say that. What I said to him was, um, 
you're worth every cent Wesley Medical Research has spent on you and you will be worth every cent more. Because I don't think you can put a dollar value on life. So why have I told you this story? My job is to focus on um, ensuring that we fund the highest possible quality research underpinned by the best scientific evidence. And we have limited resources. And we get so busy um, with the business side of things that sometimes we forget what we're here for. So this is a reminder that we're here for people like Wayne. And for the doctors in the room, I don't know whether you get desensitised to hearing these stories, whether, you know, it's just another day of making an impact in someone's life. Um, for the patients in this room, I would say that there's every possibility that Wesley Medical Research can make a difference in your life if it hasn't already done so. For our staff, um, and it's easier for the nurses and the doctors, um, this is a very real reminder of why we come to work, irrespective of whether you're a manager or an accountant. Um, and for the donors and sponsors in this room, well, um, we can't exist without your generosity. Um, and I think sometimes we forget that the intended recipient of any donation is not us, it's people like Wayne. And we're just here to facilitate and we're here to um, ensure that we meet the expectations of our donors, that we have open and transparent processes and that we can fund the best possible outcomes for our patients. Um, my hope for Wesley Medical Research is that we can touch the lives of the thousands of patients across the Uniting Care hospitals from you know, northern Brisbane to Bodrum to Harvey Bay and have that impact across the, community, the rural and remote communities as well. Um, together and only together we can continue to give Wesley Medical Research a footprint that um, will um, not only make us known nationally but internationally and will have that real and immediate impact on patient lives. And there are two individuals that understood what Wesley Medical Research is all about and they were Chris Barnard and Rosalie Martin who were no longer with us, unfortunately, but they committed years of their life to supporting research and their legacy lives on today. I'd like to acknowledge the Barnard family who are here with us tonight. Um, and I'd actually like to, them to stand up. Helen, Lachlan, Pat and Brian. Um, huge thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Events like, I'm going to cry now, <laughs> making me cry. Um, events like this wouldn't be possible without the generous support of John and Natalia Martin. And I'd like you to also please stand. Where are they? Um, and Wall and Edgar, uh, and Helen Edgar as well, who um, again, committed to sponsor the Rosalie Martin event series for a further three years. Are they here? Well, and Ed, Helen, Edgar? Thank you so much. And I'd also like to make special mention of our significant donors and supporters who are here with us tonight. Um, John Thorson from the Thorson Foundation. Uh, and from the Vijay Foundation, Sandra and Reverend Tom. Uh, Fran and Martin Aubrey. And of course, our patron um, 
Professor John Pern. Where is he? There he is. Thank you all for being here this evening. Um, each of you make Wesley Medical Research special. Um, and before I finish, I'd like to thank our wonderful staff and patients as well. I'm privileged to be working with a um, special and unique group. Please reach out to me. Um, love to hear your thoughts on where you think Wesley Medical Research should be heading. I certainly have big dreams for it. Thank you so much for coming. Claudia, thank you so much for sharing some of your heart for the organisation. It's great to know that Wesley Medical Research is in such great hands. And, you know, there are many of us here in the room, I see a lot of old faces here tonight who've been part of Advocates for many years. And some donate financially, some volunteer their time, others have volunteered for trials, and many others, most of us in the room, have contributed by sharing a story when we're out and about. So I think I can speak for everybody in the room when I say we're here behind you, and we wish you all the very best in your role. So round to our speakers. Our first speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Nick Brown, and he specialises in interventional radiology with particular interests in interventional oncology, thoracic interventions, sports medicine, and uroradiology. Nick has a number of active research interests in oncology, toxicology, and nuclear medicine, and has published numerous papers in peer-reviewed literature. He's an honorary research fellow at the Australian Venom Research Unit and also currently holds academic appointments at the University of Queensland and Transitional Research Institution. And if that wasn't enough, he's had quite a varied uh, career outside of medicine as well, um, living in New Guinea and also a sports journalist for the Sunday Mail, amongst many other things. So uh, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Nick. So it's a great pleasure to be invited to speak tonight. Um, and um, I've, been, uh, I've been working at the Wesley Hospital for the last five or six years and Wesley Research Institute as it was then and now Wesley Medical Research has certainly played a very large part in that. Um, in, in, in my life uh, since being here. Um, when it comes to men's health and urology in particular, the Wesley is quite a special place. Um, the capability of things uh, that can be done at the Wesley Hospital, the patients that we can treat, the impacts that we make are quite unique. Um, most other places uh, who uh, are active in some of the areas that we're active in aren't able to, to really reach the, the same um, uh, heights, I guess, that uh, the, 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 the doctors and the nurses and the researchers at the Wesley are able to. And one of the big reasons for that is the collaboration that exists um, in this hospital. Um, it is truly unique. Um, and the urologists, the radiologists, the radiation oncologists, the medical oncologists, the allied health staff, the researchers, the nurses, we all work very well together and um, research certainly is a team sport and um, it's because of that unique environment that allows us to do the things that we do, the things that we enjoy doing and as we heard the things that can really benefit patients. Um, there's no question that there are patients all around the world who are alive today because of the work that has been done through Wesley Hospital and the Wes Wesley Medical Research. And in terms of uroradiology, which is where I work, and certainly in John's specialty in urology, the, the relationship between urology and radiology is, is second to none. It's very, very unique. And uh, I guess it all starts to some extent with um, these two gentlemen, Professor Les Thompson and uh, Rob Parkinson, who um, first led another Wesley Medical Research-led trial um, looking at the use of MRI scanning for prostate cancer. And that was certainly the first big major study in Australia and one of the first major studies in the world that really put MRI scanning for prostates on the map. And in such a very short space of time, that was 2014. 
um, it is now universally used around the world as the dominant way of scanning prostates for prostate cancer. And the Wes Wesley can be rightly proud to, to have led the way internationally uh, as part of that study. But it's not just MRI scanning that has um, uh, us in such a unique position. Um, the collaboration between urology and radiology has allowed us to um, move on to explore a whole range of new innovations and really expand those horizons. And uh, I guess, you know, John, it's, it's down to us young guys to take the mantle of Les and Rob and, uh, you know, see if we can really try and make the most of this. And I think that's really what we've been trying to do these last few years. And you'll, you'll get a sense from what, um, from what I'll say and from what John says about all the things that we do uh, so well. Wesley Medical Research, sorry, Wesley Medical Imaging is um, Australia's leading MRI prostate provider. We've uh, scanned somewhere in the vicinity of 18,000 prostates in the last five or six years, which is more than any other single site uh, in the country. We were the first group to have um, PSMA PET scanning available in Australia. This is another area where in the field of prostate cancer, it has revolutionized care and has really made a difference to uh, what we can do for patients. That has naturally led on to a field called theranostics. It's a, it's a derivation of the diagnostic aspect of PSMA scanning that can actually be used to treat prostate cancer. And uh, we were the first uh, group in Queensland to offer this and still one of the, 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 the few in the country that are able to, um, to provide this service. Uh, certainly ours is one of the largest in the country and the expertise across the board in radiology and urology to make that happen and I might add um, medical oncology as well has really been very um, uh, has had a, a large impact on the lives of many patients with prostate cancer. We were the, uh, the first group to really embrace MRI guided prostate biopsies in Queensland and I think we are still probably um, uh, one of the leaders in that field in terms of the numbers that we have performed and this is uh, again making difference to patients lives it's um, improving the accuracy of the prost prostate biopsies when it's needed and uh, as a multidisciplinary tool it has meant that we're able to provide a much better outcome for patients but it's not just um, prostate cancer that has really seen Wesley uh, lead the way. Um, we're also embracing new treatments and expanding new horizons when it comes to benign prostate disease. Benign prostate enlargement is something that affects just about every male if they live long enough, and um, it can really have a very significant impact on their quality of life. And so actually through uh, collaborations with John and um, colleagues like Dr. Anthony Kiersoglis, uh, we've been able to launch uh, basically Australia's largest prostate artery embolisation uh, service and that has been based very much on uh, clinical trials, on research. Um, and uh, we were the first Australian group to be doing research in this area. Um, we have two additional studies underway and really the benefit here is um, it's expanding the options that men have available for managing this condition. Um, and uh, I mean, John and I can both attest to the fact that patients have received excellent outcomes uh, as part of a multidisciplinary approach to treating prostate disease. Um, oh, so the two new trials that we have underway uh, are ex expanding on the initial study that we have um, that we that we performed and uh, reported in the literature last year. And uh, again, Mosley Medical Research are involved in helping to support that. And that brings us, I guess, to the uh, culmination of a lot of that work, and uh, that is in the MAGNIFY trial. Um, it's because of the very generous support of a number of people in this room that we're able to even talk about this study tonight. Um, but it is a world first study looking at the uh, new uh, uh, reformulated uh, nano MRI contrast agent that actually allows us to, we, we hope and we think, will allow us to um, scan patients with prostate cancer and detect lymph node metastases much more effectively than we ever used to be able to do. Um, this is a collaboration with our colleagues in the Netherlands at Radboud University. They also collaborated with us on the project back in 2014 that I mentioned that uh, Les and Rob did on MRI guided, uh, sorry, on MRI scanning for prostates. 
And uh, again, it's on the back of that strong relationship that we were able to be in the box seat globally to actually run this study. Uh, we'll be running it in conjunction with the uh, Garvan Institute in Sydney, and we'll each be recruiting 60 patients to this study. And so this is what this is all about. We inject a, a contrast agent into the, uh, into the veins of a patient, uh, and then the next day they come back and have a special MRI scan. In the 24 hours since the injection or the infusion, what has happened is that the lymph nodes take up this uh, special contrast agent. It turns lymph nodes, normal lymph nodes, black. Um, as you can see down in the bottom picture, um, uh, the, the bottom part of that lymph node has turned black. But what it, what it also um, lets us see is lymph nodes with metastases in them that don't turn black. And uh, we're able to differentiate between what is a normal looking lymph node and what is a potentially diseased lymph node that contains cancer. And actually having the, uh, a much greater accuracy and a much greater resolution to detect which, pro which uh, lymph nodes may potentially have cancer in them makes a big difference to treatment planning. This is just a, a sample study. You can, I don't think I have a pointer, or do I? I can use my hands. Um, this is, uh, these are two lymph nodes in the circles. You can see this is the same scan lymph node that's turned black. And in this picture here, you can see this lymph node remains white. And so that's a lymph node that has cancer in it. And we can use this new contrast agent to detect that, we think, much more reliably. And to a much uh, smaller size than we can previously um, do. This study is about combining the benefits of PSMA PET scanning with this new nano MRI contrast agent. And uh, our, our hypothesis is that by combining these two scans, we'll be able to much more accurately detect these lymph nodes and determine what the appropriate next steps will be. Um, so we're looking for patients who have high risk prostate cancer, so they're at high risk of having lymph node metastases. Uh, and we'll be comparing these results to the pathological results after surgery. So the patients will have their prostate and their lymph nodes removed and we'll be able to correlate the results from our scans to the results from the pathology. And as I said, our hypothesis is that by combining PSMA PET scan with Combidex lymphography, which is the technical term for it, then we'll be able to improve the detection and the accuracy of these lymph node staging. Um, so what does that mean? Well, we'll be able to detect lymph nodes with metastases in them much, much smaller than we can at the moment. We'll be able to improve our detection of these lymph nodes so that they can be targeted either via surgical means or by other focal therapies such as radiation, <clears throat> and that could potentially cure a patient. Or we could prevent unnecessary lymph node dissections, whereas we have to use best guess at the moment. If we can get the Combidex MRI scan lymphography working, then we'll be able to be much more certain in our, um, in our prediction of which patients do and which patients may not need lymph node dissections. And that's certainly going to improve the quality of life for a large number of patients. So you can see that we do a lot. Uh, we're very busy. I think we have a very uh, unique set of people here. Uh, I think our relationship with each other is also quite unique. Um, but it's certainly, as I said, a team sport, and it's due to the support of a lot of the people in this room that we're able to do what we do. We enjoy what we do, and uh, I think stories that we heard before really make it all very worthwhile. So thank you very much for your kind support, and um, long may it continue. I'm happy to answer any questions, if people have questions. Just raise your hand, and I'll come over to you. We do have a microphone. Yes. If anybody, if somebody has already undergone um, prostate resection mm. and they uh, haven't had that sort of investigation, is it worthwhile them having it? Well, potentially. Um, at the moment, we're doing this as part of a trial, so the only way of having this particular type of scanning done is through the study protocol. But what we are hoping is that by completing the study successfully, uh, which will probably be somewhere in the, around the middle of next year, we should be able to um, start making firmer decisions about the benefits of when to employ this type of scanning. And so potentially, yes, it may be, depending on the results of the study, it may be that we find that um, it may be useful and applicable to patients who've had previous surgery. Um, I think it would be... Um, 
in the first instance it's patients who are being prepared for surgery but if it works in that cohort there's no reason why it wouldn't work in the post-operative cohort either. Mm -hmm. Because I have some patients who have had you know, the prostate removed and I know they haven't had any lymph nodes biopsy at all mm -hmm. because it's been reported as being localised and yes. you know, the surgeons haven't taken any um, lymph nodes away. Should mm. I be well, I discussing this sort of technique with them? Yeah, I think you should certainly be discussing it with your urology colleagues. Um, at the moment, decisions about whether to perform lymph node dissections or sort of radical extended dissections are made um, by combining a range of different information and um, coming up with an overall risk. And patients who are considered to be high risk of having potentially lymph nodes with metastases in them um, are put are put forward for uh, radical lymph node dissections along with their prostatectomies. Um, some patients who are considered low risk won't have the lymph nodes taken out or biopsied because it's considered that the risk of the surgery and the potential benefits of that are, are, don't actually outweigh the, the, the benefits of not doing the surgery. Um, so uh, again, this is another area where in the future this could revolutionise that space. And if we can detect tiny lymph nodes much more accurately, then potentially a lot more patients may be having this type of scanning to inform those decisions about who does and doesn't get the lymph nodes, mm -hmm. the lymph nodes removed. Yep. Mm -hmm. And how are you recruiting to the Re study? Recruitment is through urologists based at the Wesley Hospital. Um, so referrals to urologists at the Wesley Hospital would certainly you know, be a start. Um, but there is a, 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 a a set of cr inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria that the patients need to meet. So um, basically it's all being done through the urologists and, and again it's that collaboration with mm -hmm. between them and the radiologists that really makes this possible. Yeah. Well we might uh, wrap up the questions okay. there. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I know you're going to have to run away oh, okay. early. Yeah, um, pleasure. But I remember I remember and I'm sure many of you here will also remember um, Les Thompson coming and presenting his research. I can see many smiles around the room because it was quite, quite amusing, especially at the end. And, uh, <laughs> and I think, you know, one of the things he talked about in particular was about how this technique can actually reduce the need for unnecessary operations and target the necessary operations far more. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're just extending that work. And I think it's been a great reminder about how Wesley Medical Research is, our research is all about the near-term outcome. We're not trying to do something 20 years time. We're doing something that four or five years ago is making a difference to people's lives today. So thank you very much for your time this evening. So you can see at Wesley, we, we have a really great urology team. I'm actually privileged to work at Wesley Hospital. The actual the executive of Wesley have been fantastic for urologists. They put a lot of money and a lot of effort into making sure our program is the envy of the country and in the world, as you can see today. So we've, I'm just very privileged to work here. And we have a great research team, and we're lucky that the Wesley Medical Research are, are trying to help us as well. Um, I've done a lot of research. Um, I've done 16 papers this year, so 40 is a bit overdue. Anyway, we do a lot of research at Wesley. I've done a lot too, and I've got really great colleagues that we work with. So I'm just going to touch through some of the things we do. I just want to touch through really the importance of research and what research does and how it changes not only how we treat our own patients, but how we treat patients throughout the country and how we treat patients throughout the world. And we can't do that without research. And I think you've heard about just how important Wesley have been in the development of MRI for in, in, basically for investigation of prostate cancer. Our visiting specialists from America only last year, it was the first time that they said they'd actually do an MRI of the prostate before they do a biopsy. They're about seven years behind in, in the States and internationally behind what we've been doing at Wesley Hospital and subsequently what we've been doing in Australia. And the reason that's important is in, in the old days, if you had a, a raised prostate blood test, you have a blood test and you think you're at risk of prostate cancer, everyone would get a prostate biopsy. They'd have this ultrasound scan shoved up their backside and all these needles rammed through the backside in their prostate. Now, if you support New South Wales and the state of origin, that's a fair enough call. <laughs> but, 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 
and if you, and, and if you support the palms and the cricket at the moment. But outside that, we like to protect our Queensland men from having an unnecessary procedure. And this test that we did at, at Wesley Hospital, we showed that if you do the MRI and only biopsy what you find on the MRI, half of the men won't need a biopsy. And I can tell us the treasurer loves this because he has to spend less money on health. That's very important. And our Queensland state of origin supporters won't have a sore rectum and some blood coming out as well. And also, more importantly, we find more prostate cancer because there's just cancers we can't feel. And when you see where the cancer is on a scan, the urologist or the radiation or the radiologist knows where to stick the needle. They know where to find the cancer. And so we actually detect more cancer and we actually have to do less biopsies to find that. And so it has made a difference. Over here um, in 2009, there was an unfortunate paper saying in the New England Journal that we shouldn't be even doing prostate blood tests. And so that influenced things, the number of men having prostate blood tests dropped. But that stabilised. And then in 2012, you'll see when the MRI came in, we actually did less prostate biopsies as well and less unnecessary radical prostatectomies, but we're still treating the men that need to be treated. We're not treating the men that don't need to be treated. We don't want to do no harm. A Hippocratic Oath first do no harm. And so in 2019, we're finding the cancers that need to be found, and we're not finding the cancers that won't kill men and then unnecessarily treating them. And we're not biopsying the people that don't have prostate cancer and giving them harm in an unnecessary biopsy. So that's helped, and Wesley, I can tell you, we're really the leaders in Australia and therefore the world. There was a publication, The Lancet, three years after we did this publication that basically confirmed what we'd already found. Then the next thing is if you've got a prostate um, cancer that you, you suspect on an MRI, should you be doing that biopsy in the MRI scanner? You know, fancy technology, should we send everyone down for an MRI? That's going to be expensive. And, you know, it's not nice having a jiggly thing up your rectum, as you can see here. Can we, well, New South Wales support is okay, but I think, can, can, can we prevent that for our Queensland boys? And so we published a paper. We looked at what happens when you know where the lesion is. If you look at what you find on the MRI biopsy, and when you look at how we can biopsy with our normal techniques under an anaesthetic in theatre, patients comfortable, no harm. And in fact, there's no difference in the ability to diagnose prostate cancer once you know where it is. So our research showed us the most important thing is to do the MRI. It doesn't matter how you do the biopsy. So again, that's changing practice because of research, which without research may have taken us down another pathway. We do find some prostate cancers that will never kill people. All right? And when I say to Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, you've got a... a you know, low grade, low volume, non life threatening prostate cancer. What does Mr. Smith hear? He hears prostate cancer. And of course, he thinks, oh my God, I've got to treat this cancer. And if we treated that man, you know, we potentially could harm him for no benefit. So, research has shown us this was a randomised trial of men with these low grade prostate cancer. We gave 550 men a radical prostatectomy, 550 men radiotherapy, and the other 550 men we didn't treat. All right. So what happened in that group? We found that they were all alive in 10 years. 98.8% of men were still alive, and if they hadn't died of something else. So by giving that group of men surgery or radiotherapy, we're not benefiting them. We're potentially harming them, taking away their erectile function, perhaps taking away their continence. Right. So we know now, because of research, we feel confident. We, th we think, gee, without research, are, we, are these men going to die? Are we going to miss the boat? Research have told us, no, it's OK not to treat these guys. All right. So that's about one quarter of the men we diagnose with prostate cancer now. The other three quarters of the men we have to treat because prostate cancer is more common than breast cancer and it kills more Australian men every year than women die of breast cancer. So we need to look after our males and we need to support them and treat them, but there's a group we know we don't have to treat at the start. Now, what other things have research done? This is the way I used to operate. The other surgeon is Sid Canamassa, the most lovely man you'll ever met, the most fantastic surgeon, one of my mentors early on. Um, and I used to bend over for hours. I've still got a sore back. I've got to go to Pilates now to resuscitate my back from spending 25 years in a pelvis doing this. And we used to operate on men, do them a lot of good, but cause a lot of bleeding and you have to recover. I've got two big hands I've got to stick in someone's abdomen. So with this robotic surgery, 
um, can we make men's lives better with robotic surgery? And inside that paraphernalia in Wesley Hospital, it's fine spot the patient, all right? See if you can find him. So it's a lot of technology. Now, with this new technology came a lot of advertising, particularly in America. You know, surgery's so good, even your wife can feel the difference, you know? And if you have a robot, you're going to do better than if you have an open operation. And so there's a lot of marketing around this, and we had to say, well, what's the evidence that if you have robotic surgery, you're going to be doing better than having an operation done by an experienced open surgeon rather than an inexperienced robotic surgeon on a new machine? All right. So we, we actually did that research in Brisbane, but within five years of this technology coming to Queensland, 97% of private radical prostatectomies were done with a robot. It just took over. So we had to prove scientifically there was an advantage to new technology otherwise it's really inappropriate to do that right? and expensive so this was done at royal brisbane hospital and the two wesley urologists here myself and jeff coglin were the two surgeons in this trial it's never been it's the only randomized trial ever published in the world of open versus robotic surgery published in the lancet and what we found is that there's actually no difference in the main things you worry about which is can you cure somebody? Can you keep them from wetting their pants for the rest of their life? And if they're lucky, can they get some erections back after surgery? Now, men only think of two things when they wake up in the morning. One's what's for breakfast. But anyway, that's what we had to do. All right. So we proved it's your surgeon that's important. But we also proved with the robot, there is three times less blood loss. There's therefore less admissions to the intensive care unit or the post-operative high, high dependency unit. You get a hospital earlier. There's less, much less pain. There's better physical quality of life for the first six weeks and better emotional quality of life for the first three months. There's win, 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 win in all the minimally invasive treatments. So yes, robot trumps open prostatectomy with all the minimally invasive advantages that's, that men want, but you've still got to pick a good surgeon. And the last thing, and Nick showed you, in here, this is a man with prostate cancer on a CT. You can't see that anywhere. But if you look over here, there's the prostate cancer and here's the lymph node metastasis. This is called PET-PSMA scan. So Wesley, again, invested in this. The first hospital in Australia to do this. We do more PET-PSMA scans than any unit in Australia. And, um, and we're one of the world's best centres with this technology. So much so that um, this is a trial. It will be published at the end of this month in the British Journal of Urology International. And we've actually um, won article of a month for the British Journal of Urology. In the world, there was a thing called a meta-analysis where you get all the studies done together and you put all the, paper, all the patients together and you, and you form a paper. It's called a meta-analysis. And in that group, looking at men who were staged when they were first diagnosed, there was only 741 men in the, all the world's publication. And at Wesley Hospital, we're publishing 1,253 men. We've done more, nearly double the whole world's publication literature. So, again, we're proud and privileged to be at a centre that really supports urology research. So the final thing what I want to quickly brief, brief on today so we can go back and have some drinks. The current trial we're looking at is once you've had a radical prostatectomy, you've had your surgery, men have to be discharged with a catheter in their penis for a week to let the anastomosis heal. And in the old days, we'd keep men on antibiotics because we'd worried they'd get a urinary tract infection, which can lead to septicemia and a hospital admission. We also worry about the fact that we can develop superbugs by leaving a catheter in and keeping people on antibiotics. Now, I'm not talking about this superbug, I'm talking about the superbugs, all right? <laughs> so, um, with superbugs, by giving antibiotics, we can develop multi-resistant strains of bacteria. We can develop bad bacteria by giving people antibiotics they don't need. So what we want to do, we want to give antibiotics to people who need it, but again, we don't want to harm people that don't need it. Right. And so in, in, the, in the community now, 10% of men have what we call ciprofloxacin resistant bacteria. They're nasty bugs. But in hospital, it's 26%. So hospitals are full of bugs that have already started to mutate and become terrible. So that's why we try and get people out of hospital quicker which why robotic surgery, they go out of hospital the next day versus five days with an open operation based on Australian data. So this is what happens to antibiotics that are produced. They don't come to humans. Where do all the antibiotics go to? They go to livestock, all right? You're getting those livestock fattened and, and you want to get them, get, get them out of that, 
that farm and, and sold in the community to make money. It's a profitable thing. But we eat those antibiotics that are in the livestock, so we're eating the multi-resistant bacteria. So we're trying to decrease the development of resistant strains in the body, because then we don't have any, back, any antibiotics to basically protect ourselves from getting infected with that bacteria. And so if you travel to some centres in the world, particularly Asia, before you leave, you don't have many bad bugs. But when you come back, even though you're feeling OK, a third of people have these multi-resistant bacteria in, this, in their rectum. So this is bad. So we need a winning team, all right? Now, I had to take that slide out of my talk in New South Wales last week because we didn't win this year. But come on, boys, we'll get it next year. Anyway, we've still got a winning team. So what we're doing now is everybody that has a radical prostatectomy, when we take the catheter out, we normally give them a dose of antibiotics as, at the time of taking the catheter out. So have one dose of antibiotics in theatre and then one dose when we take the catheter out. And we've gone away from giving them the antibiotics for the whole time. So we're already decreasing the amount of antibiotics we give. But we, we don't know whether we have to give that second antibiotic when we take the catheter out. So this is a trial of all men coming into this hospital to have their catheter removed. One group of men will have an antibiotic at catheter removal. And the other group of men will have an injection that's not an antibiotic. It's, it's actually saline or water. Now, the surgeons won't know what antibiotic they're getting. The patients won't know what antibiotic they're getting, and neither will the GP. The only one that will know is the person giving it, which is our research fellow. And then every week for four weeks, our men will give a urine sample. And we'll check what happens to their urine every week for a month. So what may happen is they might get an infection and come back to hospital. They'll get treated, and then we'll know what the urine result shows. It may happen they get symptoms and go to their GP and the GP's worried about it. We'll tell the GP if they've got an infection or not. That's okay. We want to keep pe people treated properly. But what we might find is that man's got bacteria and over four weeks it just goes away by itself. All right? So what we want to know is can we safely avoid more antibiotics in people that may not need it? Or it might be actually there's so many infections in the group of men that don't get antibiotics that we should be saying to our, our, our health fund and our Medicare and our health providers that we have to give men antibiotics because their management or their treatment of care is not proper or it's not uh, high quality if we don't give that. And at the moment, the health funds don't fund Wesley Hospital for bringing them in to give them those antibiotics. And so men are paying out of money expenses that they either might not need or that the health funds should, should be providing because they need it. And that, this trial will be very important, not only to Australia, but throughout the world. This is, there's, a hundred, there's hundreds of thousands of radical prostatectomies done throughout the world every year. So this is a trial which can benefit not just Brisbane men or Queensland and Australia, but it can benefit men throughout the world. So I think it's a very important study. So I'm sorry to take up so much time, and I do thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. New South Wales players. So <laughs> <laughs> they should all get antibiotics for three weeks before the first state of origin. They'll all have diarrhoea. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> I think it's wonderful news for uh, men in Queensland that we have such wonderful research teams and collaboration happening. And it's great that we do actually share our research with the rest of the country and the world as well. Um, and you know, very proud with you and everybody else about being that world-class centre of excellence. And so congratulations for that. And I think one of the things that I also took away from it was actually there was a very wide range of related research in there. There was a lot we heard about there. It wasn't just one piece of research. So thank you very much for sharing and uh, sharing in an entertaining way, just like Les did as well. So it's, um, you will remember you both, I'm sure. And that's one of the key things is, you know, it is about remembering what our speakers have said and going away and sharing that news.
So that concludes uh, what we have for tonight in terms of the presentations. We do have um, drinks and nibbles, etc., next door. And we will also be drawing the raffle next door. So if you haven't bought your tickets yet, there'll be an opportunity to do that um, before you go through. So thank you all very much for coming and uh, look forward to speaking to you afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.